Good morning, everybody. Um, sort of very excitedly watching the uptick of numbers uh, that show the participants joining us. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Amada Cruz. I'm the Ilse Ball Nordstrom Director and CEO of the Seattle Art Museum. Thank you for joining us this morning, our new Saturday University Lecture Series, Encountering Asia, Plunderers and Collectors. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that the Seattle Art Museum is located on the homelands of the Duwamish and the traditional territories of the Suquamish and Muckleshoot peoples. We further acknowledge the many urban indigenous people who call Seattle home. Our Saturday, our new Saturday University Lecture Series now takes place monthly on second Saturdays from today through June 11, 2022. The 10 lectures will share stories of recent archeological discoveries, expeditions, and explorations. Collecting and repatriation, shipwrecks and piracy, and more. Please look out for Gardner Center's e-newsletters and sign up for future lectures. To our longstanding partners, the Jackson School for International Studies at the University of Washington and the Elliott Bay Book Company, I would like to give our special thanks. If you are interested in watching the recordings of past lectures, they are available on our YouTube channel. You can find links on the SAM website on the Gardner Center's web page. Today, we will have the pleasure to hear from two museum directors, Jay Shu and Mimi Gates, on the fascinating archaeological discoveries at Zhangxingdui, located in southwest China. Jay will speak for approximately 45 minutes and then will be joined by Mimi for a conversation. Afterwards, Feng Ping, our Foster Foundation Curator of Chinese Art, will moderate the Q&A. To ask a question, please look for the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. Feel free to send your questions at any time during the program and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Now, it is my great pleasure to announce Jay Shu, the Barbara Bass Baker Director and CEO at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. Jay was the first Asian American Museum Director elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Before he took the helm at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco in 2008, he was the Pritzker Chairman of the Department of Asian and, Asian and Ancient Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. Here at SAM, Jay served as curator of Chinese art some 20 years ago. He began researching on ancient civilizations at Sanxin Dui in the early 1990s and has since collaborated closely with Chinese archeologists at the site. In 2001, Seattle Art Museum organized the landmark exhibition, Treasures from a Lost Civilization, Ancient Chinese Art from Sichuan, curated by Jay Xu under the leadership of Mimi Gates and in collaboration with a group of leading scholars of ancient China. This eye-opening exhibition was also presented at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and absolutely awed the audiences on both coasts. It was the first and perhaps only SAM organized exhibition that traveled to the Met in SAM's recent history. In today's lecture, Jay will review the jaw-dropping discoveries of the Sanxin Dui site in 1986, introduce the latest findings from the present excavations and discuss the material culture of the mysterious Sanxin Dui civilization. After Jay's lecture, Mimi Gardner Gates, Sam's Director Emerita and founder of the Gardner Center will join Jay for a recount on how the 2001 exhibition was organized. Mimi herself, as many of you know, is a scholar of Chinese art. Before her remarkable tenure at SAM, Mimi served as curator of Asian art and then as director at the Yale University Art Gallery. Even after retirement, our tireless Mimi still serves on many boards, including the Don Juan Foundation for which Mimi is the chairwoman. And now I am happy to turn the virtual podium over to Jay Xu. Jay. Good morning, everyone. Hello, Amada, for your kind introduction. Greetings from San Francisco. I miss Seattle. 
let me uh, share my screen. I hope you can see the screen uh, fully now. This is the topic of my uh, talk today. Twenty years ago, uh, in May two thousand and one, the exhibition titled "Treasures from a Lost Civilization." Ancient Chinese art from Sichuan opened in the downtown Seattle Art Museum to public acclaim. Serving as the Chinese art curator then, I had the privilege of curating the exhibition, which took more than four years to accomplish and turned out to be the most expensive show in the history of the Seattle Art Museum. These two pictures bring back dear and the nostalgic memory of that wonderful time. And I hope many of you in the audience had an, an opportunity to see the exhibition in Seattle or in the other cities that the ex exhibition traveled to. About half of the exhibition featured the artifacts from a lost civilization discovered in a place called San Xingdui. And that discovery took place in 1986. 15 years before the Seattle exhibition, still very fresh in terms of uh, archeological discoveries. To this day, the exhibition remains the most comprehensive and uh, in-depth presentation of the Sanxin Bay civilization in North America. 20 years went by very fast. On March this year, San Xinhui shocked, shocked the world again with the news that six pits filled with ancient bronzes, whole elephant tusks, and other artifacts and the materials had been discovered and been excavated since November 2019. Here we see two details of one of the, those six pits. The news immediately created a huge sensation across China, as this is the second time the Sanxin Dui had produced the wonders. If there is a short list of household names for archeological discoveries in China, Sanxin Dui is now arguably the most famous. The new discovery is the impetus for today's talk. I'd like to thank Xiao Jingwu and Ping Feng for kindly giving me the opportunity and for to Mimi Gates, for agreeing to have a conversation following my talk. Let's begin our journey of exploring San Xingdui by watching a short video from the latest excavation. But first of all, I have to get out of the sharing and then share the video. Okay. Again, I hope you see the screen and uh, you're able to hear the sound.新发现了六个七五坑
是我们的一些设施，很多设施呢就不是用在考古上的，有我们现场的一些嗯、呃、行架。就是我们可以在上面上下，就避免直接接触在坑里面。这对于我们现场文物保护来说，可以说是至关重要的，因为里面有很多脆弱的文物。我们还有其他的保护措施，比如这次发掘应该是创新性的，都穿上了防护服，避免我们身上的一些毛发或者灰尘啊落入坑内污染样品。至于有人说它是外星文明，当然我们肯定不这么认为。我们知道三星堆这个遗址是呃前后延续了很长时间，从距今四千八百年一直到距今两千六百年，也就是这个遗址一直沿用了两千二百年。其中这几个坑是三星堆文化最晚阶段的，也就是距今三千二百年左右。这个年代在整个的中国青铜时代处于什么样的阶段呢？就是商代的晚期，这个时候在中原、在安阳、殷墟时期，已经有大量的青铜器被铸造出来了。无论从青铜器的铸造技术还是精美程度来说，客观的说，三星堆的青铜器肯定是不如中原地区的精美的，铸造水平也是更低的。但为什么三星堆这么神秘、这么引人注意呢？是在于这个文化有它的独特性，它的很多器物造型是在其他地方所没有见到过的星堆的青铜器又极具视觉冲击力和震撼力，就披上了一层神秘的面纱。其实呢，随着我们三星堆考古工作的不断深入，随着我们越来认识的越来越细致，我觉得这层神秘的面纱可能会慢慢的被揭开。OK， here are the video. Let me stop sharing this one. And going back to my PowerPoint, I hope you can see the slides where we left.、Um, that is the best video in English I could find. I think it surely provides a, a visual、uh, impression. Probably is very striking in terms of、uh, the. Dramatic views of the excavations and objects being excavated. It also provides a useful information、uh, in terms of、uh, location of where San Xingdui is and the time frame of the、uh, settlement in San Xingdui, particularly、uh, the pits,、uh, that, which represents the high point of、uh, that civilizations. I must say that I don't necessarily agree with everything. Said in that、uh, short video, in, for example, the identification of the culture with the Su Kingdom that would come later, and uh, and uh, also its relationship with the civilization in the Yellow River region. There was certainly relationship, but the nature of which、uh, is still、uh, has a lot to discuss and explore. But overall, I hope it provides a useful framework and first impression. Um, merely thirty-five years ago, before the sensational discovery was made in nineteen eighty-six, very few people had ever heard of the name San Xingdui, a small village situated towards the western edge of the Sichuan Basin in southwest China, and that in the Red、uh, Oval. 
one major river that go through the Sichuan Basin is the Changjiang or Yangtze River that probably better known to many of you, which is the longest river in China and the third longest in the world. In ancient times, Sichuan was typically perceived as a peripheral region, far away from center of the Chinese world in the middle Yellow River region, represented here by that oval. The distance between those two places is about 750 miles, about the same distance between Seattle and San Francisco. Before the 1986 discovery, the archaeological record in the Sichuan Basin was extremely poor for the early Bronze Age in the second half of the second millennium BCE, giving rise to the impression that Sichuan was a cultural backwater compared to other parts of China, such as the Yellow River region. This dearth gave a further contrast to the sensational discovery in 1986, because nobody had expected the existence of an ancient civilization in that part of China, and one that expressed itself with such striking images not seen anywhere else. There is a great deal we can talk about San Xingdui. Given the time limit, however, I will only be able to provide a very brief introduction, focusing on the 1986 discovery and the present excavation. Pit one of the two that were discovered in 1986 was rectangular in shape containing some kind of a ceremonial deposit. The pit measures about 15 feet long, 11.5 feet wide, and five feet deep. The slides on the right is a detail of the pit. The objects in the pit, including strange bronzes, such as a dozen life-size human-like heads with sharply defined facial features and the bulging eyes. Moreover, gold, a material rarely used elsewhere, appeared conspicuously. Here you see a gold shield, nearly 56 inches long, originally wrapped around a wooden staff that was clearly an insignia of power. And here you see the head. On the other hand, the pit also contained more familiar objects like bronze vessels and jade blades. Ritual bronze vessels were the hallmark of the Bronze Age civilization elsewhere in China. Some of the jade and the stone blades at San Xindui, like the deck X on your right, belongs to a type popular at that time throughout much of China. When the archaeologists finished the excavation, they had unearthed more than 400 artifacts of bronze, gold, stone, jade, and pottery, along with a dozen actual elephant tusks. All the objects were intentionally battered, broken, or burnt before burial. On the same day, as the archaeologists were concluding the excavation of a pit one, a bronze head was accidentally found about 100 feet away and pin number two was thus discovered. Pit two was also rectangular in shape in a similar in burial condition, but its content was even richer by far. The deposit, though appearing chaotic in their burned and broken conditions, comprises three distinct layers. The topmost layer, or the last group of objects entered into the pit, as you see on your left, are elephant tusks. Below the layer of the tusks was two layers of an amazing pile of bronze artifacts. And then here on the right, you see the middle layer. And some of them are huge in scale and odd in, experience, uh, in appearance, such as a life-size bronze figure standing on a high pedestal measuring altogether 8.5 feet tall. 
and a large bronze mast with the eyeballs protruding from the eye sockets and the flaring ears raised alertly, measuring 54 inches wide and 26 inches tall. Here, of course, you are seeing two pieces after restoration. Here you see how they were lifted out of the pit during the time of the excavation. In all, pit two contained 67 actually elephant tusks and hundreds of artifacts and the, the variety including everything that uh, already uh, we mentioned, the, the different categories appearing in pit one. Pit two was only richer. Altogether, the objects weigh more than one ton. Associated with the two pits is a large scale city whose walls survived in low mounds that began to be recognized as man-made walls a year earlier in 1985. This discovery took place as the village of San Shinto as well. Here we see a remnant elsewhere in the city, however, which turned out to be part of the West Wall. San Shinto literally means three star mounds, and they were the first to be identified as walls. In the years since 1986, extensive survey and excavations have been undergoing to map out the city. By now, the archaeologists have ascertained the walls on all four sides. The area surrounded by the outer walls measures one to 1.25 miles from east to west and 1.25 miles north to south, enclosing an area of about one and a half square miles. One of the largest cities in the Bronze Age China. Inside city, there were other remnants of wars, including the three star mounds in the south as pointed out uh, by the arrow and the uh, inset square shows the eight pits altogether, two of which were excavated in 1986, six new ones sort of in between them. And we can look at a larger picture later. Besides, a portal kiln, numerous pits containing jade and stone artifacts, large areas of house foundations, a large scale foundations of a possible palace or temple complex have been found by now, indicating a settlement of substantial size. This is a latest of site map that I um, got from my Chinese colleagues. It give the general indication of the walls and where San Shinto is situated and different functionalities in di different precincts. However, we must be reminded this is extremely tentative. With the walls, the house foundations, the staggering wealth from the two pits, and their striking iconography, ancient Sichuan emerged decidedly as a highly developed and civilized region in early Bronze Age China. Let's now explore the internal relationship between the two pits and between the objects so as to gain understanding of their nature and the possible original appearance and assemblage. The two pits are close together, comparable in size and oriented alike with their corners aligned with cardinal directions. Although their deposits look chaotic at a first glance, they were filled in an orderly way with a comparable range of objects, including valuables such as cowrie shells and elephant tusks. And the bronzes and jades, most of which had been burned and or hammered or battered, it is clear that the breakage occurred before burial because different parts of a single object were sometimes found scattered. Since the walls of the pits show no sign of fire or smoke, the burning must have occurred before the burial as well. After the deposition of the objects, the pits were sealed with a filling 
of Earth pounded hard. Though there are important differences between the two pits, so many common features make it reasonable to suppose that pits represent two performances of a single ceremony, some sort of a ritual in which offerings were first burned or broken and then buried. Perhaps breaking and burning were ways of quote unquote, killing artifacts or certain sacred rite of passage so that they could make their way from this world to some supernatural realm. The high material culture at Sanxin Dui was predominantly expressed in the form of bronze images, often as sculptures. The images may be sorted into two loose groups. The first consists of a nature or supernature figures, heads, and masks. The second consists of trees, ornaments for trees, and cre creatures associated with trees, birth especially. To introduce both groups, I will select only one signature object from each. One is this life-size human figure, which measures, as I mentioned earlier, 8.5 feet tall, including the pedestal on which he stands. This person wears an elaborate crown richly decorated garments and stands on a high pedestal. All these surely signify a figure of a high status. This figure probably also wore earrings as indicated by the holes in the earlobes. Yet the figure is barefooted, which suggests the likelihood of standing on a piece of sacred ground. The figure is immediately striking for its oversized hands, <coughs> which may very well mimic the attitude taken during an offering ritual. What might the person, the figure hold? We know that it was buried among 67 elephant tusks. And noticing that two hands do not form a straight line between them, but rather a curve, we might reasonably speculate that the figure held an elephant tusk in a gesture of offering. The, the richly decorated garments that the figure wears comprises three layers. This is the outmost mantle, which I will talk about decoration just a minute later. This is the middle garment, mostly hidden by the outer mantle because it's shorter, but some parts of it was exposed, including it's a V-shaped neckline, both in the front and in the back. And then the innermost garments, which comprises two parts, upper and one. But then this is, a, at this point, um, is also um, not entirely certain whether it may have been one long piece as well. It is the longest and also has surface decoration in the visible part of the garment below, in the part below the, uh, um, the lower edge of the outer mantle. The outer mantle is decorated with fabulous dragons, four in total arranged in two rows and in each row arranged back to back. Let's decipher one of them. This is the head with a hanging tongue. Crest have a shorter one in the front and the longer one uh, behind it. This is the body, snake-like body. And this is a wing. The four legs with the claws in fist and the hinder leg with the claw in fist also. Now, the life-size figure is the only one at San Xin Dui, but two sacrificial pits altogether yielded about 50 life-size human-like heads, like the one on your left. Many of them are similar in size 
at the figure's head, and that their facial features are very close. Notice that the head has a pointed V-shaped neckline at the front. Now please notice the neckline of the life-size figure on your right. The area left bare by the robe corresponds to the pointed neck of the head on your left. Such a shape also appears on the back. Here are the back views. Again, both have a V-shaped necklines. The comparison suggests that the life-size figure is perhaps the bronze translation of a sculpture of which typically only the head was bronze. Put another way, we might speculate that while the offering ritual was being performed, the heads would be mounted on posts of a similar height. Therefore, instead of a one single statue, there probably was a large assembly of them. Here is a view of different heads in an exhibition uh, elsewhere, not in Seattle, probably in Southern California, I believe. And those posts, which formed the bodies, were probably made of a material that now perished, right? Because we no longer see their bodies. And in my view, most likely it was wood. There are important clues for this speculation. And we have already noticed the features of the figure were meticulously depicted, such as the crown, the facial features, and particularly the three layers of garments whose depiction enable us to actually figure them out, as well as other details. Yet this body looks oddly columnar, really appearing like a post. And I think, of course, tree naturally give the shape of a, a column. Besides, if we notice the facial features, they're often the case large and sharp cut and easily relatable to the wood cutting tradition. So therefore, I believe that one strong likelihood is the wood, uh, the post that forms the body of the vast majority for those heads. And at that time, of course, the Sangri region was heavily forested. And to even today, there remains large areas of fossilized wood, as we see here. I made this prediction or a hypothesis many years ago, after which, I'm very glad to see the finding of remaining wooden sculptures from a nearby site called Qingsa in the city of Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan. Sangdui, as we know, is about 40 miles in the northeast of Chengdu. And this is a picture of the remnant of a wooden Sculpture looked like a post found at Jingsa at the time of the excavation. And this is a line drawing of that wooden post. As we know, Jingsa site overlaps a little bit with Sanxingdui, but largely follows it. And clearly, the iconography here is quite different, even though there are certain similarities with those found in uh, but clearly it proves the existence of the wood carving tradition in the region. Actually, another time I'd be happy to talk about architecture tradition in Sanxingdui as well, which is entirely gone, of course. Moreover, in their original state, the heads and the figures would be animated with touches of paint. The now sightless eyes on the majority of heads would be painted in black. So would be their eyebrows as seen on the small figure on your right. Other surviving traces on the head indicates 
that their ear horrors, nostrils, and lips would be smeared with a red paint. In other words, those heads and figures wore heavy makeups. Perhaps such animations were intended to give the heads and the figures the power of vision, hearing, smelling, and speaking, or even tasting. And they would certainly form a dramatic contrast with the golden sheen of the new bronze and reinforce the emphasis already given to those features by their disproportionate sizes. Besides the facial colorings, the ears of the heads are all perforated, clearly for wearing earrings and the other ornaments, such as um, uh, just like uh, the life-size figure would. The head on your left also sports a large ornament soldered onto the back of the head. As we see here, the ornament takes the form of a curved tube with flaring ends in a construction around the middle, perhaps copying a piece of cloth that tied it to the hair or head. The offerings at the openings at both ends suggest further ornaments, perhaps a plume. Other heads must have been similarly ornamented. The back of the head of the life-size figure, for example, has a pair of rectangular holes clearly meant for a head ornament. With their faces painted, their bodies dressed in depicted robes or perhaps even real silk robes, and the crown with dramatic headdresses, a gathering of such figures have been indeed an awesome sight. So from images, we can de depict, uh, uh, predict the silk industry probably was advanced in the scientific civilization as well. But in the 1986, there was no finding of that. As mentioned before, the other major group of uh, bronze images consists of trees, ornaments for trees, and as creatures associated with trees, birds especially. This partially restored tree is monumental and it's only partially restored. Measuring 13 feet tall, the picture on the right was taken in 1999 at the scientific site when the tree was photographed for the Seattle exhibition catalog. Standing next to me is one of the two principal archeologists. And here, both of us serve to illustrate how tall the tree is. The tree has three layers of three branches each. Each branch is perched by bird with a hooked beak. The top of the tree trunk must also have been inhabited by a creature. Now missing, perhaps a bird like those on the branches, or in my view, more likely, a creature's more fantastic, giving its prominent primary position, such as a kind of a human bird hybrid, as you see on your right, for example. And that's one originally stood on top of a miniature tree, for the bird is only three inches tall. Here on the right, you're looking at the lower half of the tree. Besides the birds, the tree is also inhabited by dragon-like creatures who plants its foreleg on the rim of the tree base and sends its rope-like body undulating upward. We also see mouth without a hanging tongue, wing, which appears rather small here, and also a hind leg which appears in the shape of a graceful human-like hand with long fingers. I think this is among the most beautiful hand I have ever seen with such a beautiful long fingers. Technically, the bronze is joined to the tree trunk by short bridges between them. And we can see four such bridges. One in this part, this one is more visible in the picture. Third one is here and then another one at the top. This indicates that the dragon's body 
would be extended all the way to the top of the tree. But now half of its body is missing. Actually, the dragon that I just mentioned is the same kind as the one depicted on the outer mantle of the life-size figure. Just very quickly, let me show you their corresponding features. Head, head, without tongue sticking out. The crest, similar, particularly a shorter one in the front and the longer one in the back. Body, wings, foreleg, hind leg. The, the difference here is um, the uh, hind leg, one is in fist, the other is in open palm. Here are a few more um, also missing from the tree at this partially restored condition are ornaments once hung from the tree. Notice there is a small hole at the tip of the bird's speak. This is one of the nine. Such holes are prevalent on the tree. They were clearly used for hanging small ornaments like jingles. On your left is one such example. Here are a few more examples of such ornaments. One still with this hanging app device. They each measure up several inches tall. Here we see the hanging apparatus in the beak of another miniature bird standing on a tree. The branches of a tree may also have been hung with movable but permanently attached bronze rings. The slides on your left show one such branch or jade rings, such as we see on the right. That is why I said earlier that objects such as jade and stone discs whose identity are not self-evident might be identified as ornaments for the images. Therefore, no matter how fantastic the tree looks now, it is quite removed from its original appearance. In a way, we must imagine the tree originally must have looked like, to make a loose analogy, a Christmas tree full of whistles and bells. Now you may ask, if decked with so many ornaments, how come none is seen on the tree now? That is because this is how the tree appeared at the time of the excavation. In dozens of fragments like water pipes in a plumber's workshop. In the photo, you see the base of the tree, monumental tree we have just discussed. And then you see the base of another tree, smaller. And this is the one on your left which now survives in a little more than the base and the parts of the trunk. And its base is a kneeling figure. We may now ask how ritual assemblage involving the monumental trees and the life-size figures would actually look like. Again, we may rely on internal evidence for clues. On your left is a jade blade from pit two and its line drawing, 21 inches long, uniquely carved with a pictorial design. On the right is a miniature altar surviving only in fragments, suggesting a possible layout of the ritual assemblage, as we can see in its line drawing. To decipher what is going on in these two scenarios and how they and other related objects are connected, will require another hour, and we're probably running out of time here now. So I have to say now let's turn our attention to the excavation taking place as we speak. You have seen a similar picture as an inset for the larger site map before. And you can see K1 and K. K is the initial 
letter of the Chinese romanization for the word Ken, K-E-N-G. So K1 means pit, K stands for pit. And the one in uh, the pink are the, the two excavated in 1986. The red ones are the ones discovered in 19, uh, 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 in 2019 and being excavated as we speak, appearing in red. And you can tell that they are in the same precinct. And also their corners all aligned with the same directions and happen to be aligned with cardinal directions. And here you see the state of condition of excavation. And they have set up captures in the uh, uh, um, in which the each pits can be excavated under constant temperature and humidity, as already mentioned in the introductory video. And the archaeologists are typically suspended as they excavate, excavate so that they won't interfere uh, with the material and the features and the condition inside pit. It's truly extremely advanced. I think it is surely most advanced in China and probably in the world. And this is a, stocking, uh, a stark contrast between 1986 and the 2001. And uh, that tells us the difference, the magnitude of the difference over 35 years in field archaeology in China. And among the range of objects excavated this time, there were familiar objects once again, like the call of the disc on the left and the forked blade on the right. And the gold marks, some of which were clearly applied to the bronzes and some of which may be having wooden body and face on which it sits. And a enigmatic piece of gold foil, like cutoffs, and has been temporarily suggested representing a bird and ivory objects. And this is a one major findings. Actually in the 1986 discovery, there were traces of ivory because as you know, the excavation condition was so primitive, many traces and features were lost, including traces of ivory fragments. And although there were a lot of whole elephant tusks were found both in 1986 and now, I think now more than 1,000 have been found among those six pits. But it's only this time that we'll be able to see the real fragments of ivory uh, objects, the objects that are made of uh, elephant tusks uh, with carvings and shaped into various implements, extremely important. And this is a blurred picture of quarry shells, vast quantity of them this time, as well as 1986. And this type of quarry shells originated from India Ocean. So long distance trade clearly uh, was part of the economic life for San Xintui, but such trade most likely are uh, indirect, related through way stations between uh, destinations. And most importantly, they for the first time found traces of silk. This is a terribly burned slump of uh, black dirt if uh, we do not have the implements to observe it carefully and enlarge uh, um, in great sizes in order to decipher. So huge kudos to the local archeologists who aided with their advanced equipment, passionate for the work they are conducting for the first time as attend existence of silk in San Xindui, and thus a uh, silk industry. We of course had already 
be able to predict there were such industry existed from various features among the bronze images, particularly the garments of the large life-size figure wears. But this is a wonderful new proof. And then for the first time, a wooden box, so far largely empty, but it's as we speak, it's being excavated and found a jade knife. And the, the kind of knife very similar to the knife that was used the, um, with a textile loom. So probably this is a box for textile. They are still uh, excavating it and trying to analyze the filling, which is mostly in the shape of dirt to uh, find out if there are traces of uh, um, silk. And also stone implements. And the labels here saying from pin number eight, the large charm stone. And of course, this once again is a very preliminary uh, identification. I'd be happy to give us a benefit of doubt that may be a stone charm, but I think a lot of interpretations will have to wait for further excavation and ideally uh, the, uh, the expeditious publication of uh, these new finds. Now, let me spend just the last few minutes talk about two most extraordinary objects from one of the six pits, pit number three. One is a figure clearly in a kneeling posture, as you see on the left, holding his hand out uh, in a circle, and but carrying a life-size bronze, actual bronze vessel on, top, on the top of his head. Very extraordinary. Back in 1986, actually there was a miniature um, sculpture showing a kneeling figure with a half naked body carrying a bronze vessel on the head. And this is the area of the bronze head. This piece itself, we can speak a lot about what it may be missing from above and missing from below. It's fascinating, but here that's just making this comparison. Clearly this is an image and now we have a actual a piece being found. And in the picture in the middle is when the piece was halfway excavated. The other figure I'd like to talk about is this extraordinarily interesting and enigmatic assembly. Look like a figure, right? If we orient it this way, you may start to see as the local archeologist, when they first publicized this one in the news media, identified it as a sitting figure. So if in a sitting posture, this part would be the neck with the head missing, two arms and two legs, and sitting on a square uh, uh, outer. And uh, uh, somehow the body uh, went through the outer self. So, but it is certainly reasonable. But when I look at it carefully, I feel there's something strange going on with this piece. Not so much that the leg coming out of the outer, is because the bodily features of this figure just looks kind of uh, strange to me. One of which is a pair of legs. A sitting figure probably would unlikely have the shape of a feet forming this way. And also job attention is only through the picture. I've never been able to get down to site because of the pandemic, right? Is this a line that I thought I see in the picture? So these are the clues enable me to sort of digging around, trying to see what the assembly might have been instead of a sitting figure. So, if we turn the picture in a different way and see the legs in this posture, immediately we can recall our memory of the small kneeling figure carrying a bronze vessel on the head to our mind again. And this is its legs, clearly similar to a kneeling posture, right? And then if we turn the picture further 90 degree, 
And we may start to see, actually, this may be a person carrying a square outer on the head. And the carrying things on the head is clearly a common phenomenon as sanction Dui. Again, making this comparison, and you see the line here actually corresponding to the line there, which means is the hairline in the back of the head. Of course, my interpretation will not be able to explain why the pair of legs there, if the legs, in my view, are not related with the, this figure. And this is side view, and you can compare the hands, very similar, even the angle of the hands, very similar. And furthermore, if we pay attention to those very fat legs on the altar, we may start to see a pair of eyes. Only in this way, the eyes look right oriented. Otherwise, in a sitting posture, those eyes will be upside down. So with, armed with these observations, I made a prediction publicly because I was interviewed numerous times for this new discovery that this one is not a sitting figure, but most likely a figure carrying a altar on the head. Of course, I cannot know whether it's a kneeling figure or standing figure because the lower part of the body at that time is still missing and so far have not been found. Sure enough, just several days ago, this whole piece was retrieved from pin number three. And here you see it. This is the uh, figure. And this is a pair of legs, very strange pair of legs. And surprisingly and not surprisingly, on the other side is a figure. If we turn this side and we can see, there's a figure, the head, holding hands, hands out with fantastic crowns on the top of the head. And this is the pair of uh, legs in the back. So this is a kneeling figure with both head and the legs uh, curling up. What a fantastic imagination and artistic rendering. There's a whole lecture that can be given to the wonderful imagination and artistic creation in the Sanshin Dui images. And for the first time, I'm delighted to see the face of that figure carrying the altar on the head and also the face of the uh, other figure to which that pair of legs belonged. Last two slides. This is a small kneeling figure with fantastic hairdos. I think it's more fantastic than any fantastic than anything that we can imagine even in the 21st century. And on the right is a strange beast whose identification is very interesting. But most importantly, it has a standing figure, miniature standing figure on its head. And this is miniature standing figure is very similar as the life-size figure that we spend quite a bit of time to discuss. And this is the hairdo. So let me show you the last two pictures are the scenes of our work at San Xin Dui. Here is Mimi's visit for the first time in San Xin Dui, 1997, in October. And this is one of uh, the additional field trips that she took to San Xin Dui. And I was there to do the field work, researching for the exhibition and researching for the catalog. I think she's here to make sure I was doing well and also make sure I was doing my work. And then here are some of the pictures about diplomatic efforts in Beijing dealing with the state administration of cultural heritage to negotiate this extraordinarily demanding exhibition. And here is the opening of the exhibition um, at which the newly appointed ambassador from China came to grace the opening. And let me finally get back to the view of the Seattle Art Museum in downtown location, the banners and the view of the exhibitions installation. And here you see the long figure. So this exhibition is truly in many ways extraordinary, not only because the objects 
included, but also the story behind it and how the uh, obstacles were overcome, some truly extraordinary larger than life forces taking place during the same time should be fascinating. So at this point, I'd like to invite Mimi to come to join me for a conversation. Mimi. Hi, Jay. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. It's, it's great. I just, I just want to thank you for such a fascinating talk and for showing us the details of so many of the recently excavated objects. I mean, things, things I had never seen. So yeah. it's really so informative. So Since informative. That, thank you so much. Things are truly fast moving. And um, some uh, I just got actually some of the most exciting pictures last night because uh, in the last three days, it was the third nationwide broadcasting of actual excavations. The first one in March, second one in May, and just the last three days with the last episode ending at like uh, uh, 12 o'clock midnight. So I stayed up to watch it <laughs> and got some <laughs> new information. So things are fast moving. But if I may, let's get back to 20 uh, years ago. What a wonderful time and thank you for the support. So, I mean, um, maybe we can start with a conversation. You want to go ahead and ask me what, questions? What, what? Why don't you talk a little bit about what stage you were at your career in your career when you arrived in Seattle in, in uh, 1996? And why, why did you want Seattle? There were also other other jobs in, in the curatorial work in Chinese art open elsewhere. Uh, thank you. And um, I was a, a truly a newbie. Some of you may know that I started my career in, in Shanghai Museum in 1986 and uh, uh, 83 and worked there for seven years. So I did have some uh, museum experience in China, but otherwise I had no museum experience in America. But however, as I studied for my PhD at Princeton, Princeton of course has a wonderful museum and I worked closely uh, as a student there and learning from it. And uh, when you hired me, I was a, a pre-doctoral fellow at the Asian Art Department in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I still remember vividly, you came to New York, of course, for many other businesses as well. And you, you took me out to lunch at the, the uh, Mets uh, cafeteria, staff cafeteria, and we talked. I was really impressed with your passion and with your ambition to transform the Seattle art museum and particularly to an Asian art curator that how importance, how great importance you attach to uh, the Asian art and given the long standing history of the Seattle Art Museum, which opened in the volunteer park with a very strong Asian art collection. So the tradition is there and I can sense the great uh, energy. And um, I was not sure that uh, you would uh, offer me the job. But in due course, you flew me to Seattle for interview. I still remember the hotel state uh, you called uh, Alexis on Second Avenue. It's still there. The last time I was there, <laughs> it's still there. And, uh, and uh, I don't know how the interview went, but uh, eventually you did offer me the job. I was uh, thrilled because, you know, be able to work and um, to be able to uh, uh, serve a great museum and with great potential in an environment that is beautiful. And, uh, and I can truly um, uh, uh, give my energy and uh, uh, thinking and imagination is a, a opportunity that is not, was not to be missed. But I also was worried that because I was really nobody, I was only a, fellow at the Met and you would uh, took risk uh, uh, with me. And so although there are the many other museums, but all these conditions combined, I think uh, Seattle is obviously the wonderful choice for me. Well, now, may I turn the table on you and ask you a question? Okay, okay. How did you find the uh, 1986 excavation of Sanctuary site 
so compelling and uh, as a as a strong topic for exhibition when I proposed to you and you would support such an ambitious project that turned out to be the most expensive in Sam's history. And there are any number of Chinese art, terracotta warrior, for example, and others we could do. So why you so decidedly through your weight behind it, which is really instrumental to make it happen. And why, if I may ask, did you take a risk on young scholar, a curator called <laughs> Jay Xu? Well, I, I think museum professionals, particularly those in senior leadership positions, have a responsibility to nurture the next generation of museum professionals. And when, when we hired you, I had the confidence that, uh, that, that you would really rise and, and be a, a, a wonderful scholar curator. I had absolutely no doubt. Actually, in the interview, you said, this is the job I want. And I had to hire you. Uh, but uh, it wasn't I, that easy. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact was, you also already had significant knowledge of Sun Ching Dui. Um, you had done a lot of research on it, your, your dissertation on that subject. And to me, it was a calculated risk, but a risk well worth taking. So uh, that, that was certainly one critical factor in agreeing. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to grow. So by doing an international exhibition, and I was being a specialist in Chinese art, I was anxious for the Seattle Art Museum to do a major exhibition uh, of Chinese art. I also realized that uh, I, I also realized that it, Sun Ching Jui was an extraordinary site. And they, as an archeological find, and uh, here was a lost civilization. At Yale, I had, I had learned that um, I had studied early China. I, and Casey John, the professor I studied with said, had proposed the theory that Chinese civilization did not evolve from a single area outwards, but uh, rather was a series of, of interactions, interactive spheres uh, that uh, in different regions that, and it was their interaction that produced what we know today as Chinese civilization. So I was confident it would advance knowledge. And I firmly believe that museums, they're not just a place for pretty, pretty objects, but they're also a place to advance knowledge, a place to explore ideas. And this ex exhibition would do, uh, would do exactly that. So um, that's why I had the confidence. And it was a leap of faith, but I'm, I'm famous for being risk-taking. And uh, this was a risk I'm very happy we took. So let me throw it back, back to you. And um, what do you think that San Xing Dui represents in the history of, of early China? I mean, this is going up to about 10,000 feet, but uh, what, is, what does it tell us you know, about how early Chinese civilization evolved? And also how when you have a civilization like San Xing Dui that has no written record, how do you, how do you recreate the, the character of that civilization? Thank you for the question. I, I think you actually earlier alluded to it already, the word lost civilization. And earlier on in the lecture, I mentioned because nobody predicted, everybody assumed it was a cultural backwater in the Bronze Age China, late, uh, the early Bronze Age China around the you know, second half of the second million BCE. And suddenly, you know, it just appeared. And of course there are traces to it, but the magnitude of those two pits in 1986 really is overwhelming to everyone. So be able to uh, uh, write about it and uh, to able to uh, 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 curate an exhibition about it is uh, very fascinating. For the early history, uh, for the history of early China, it of course completely rewrote the history about particular region in this case, the Sichuan Basin, 
But in doing so, it also helped to really open up the existing perceptions and interpretations about early China. Early China is really a mosaic. Now we understand with the many, many regional civilizations interacting with each other directly or indirectly and have their own very unique features, but sometimes with a commonality as well. So for example, Sahin Dui is arguably the most distinctive a regional uh, civilizations. But when I say regional here, I'm only talking about a region. It's not in the sense of a peripheral and the center. I think one thing that uh, really enables us to topple the existing, the idea is the, the certain parts in geographical China that we know today are centered, the other are peripheral. But I don't think that model exists and is a, 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 a valid anymore. They're just different regions. And um, in this case, in Sichuan. And with the most extraordinary iconography, and I, the reason for which I think one manufactures, and I say that, you know, early on, very strong wooden carving sculpture tradition preceding the bronzes, which may not, which it clearly completely lost. And now we can only reconstruct from the bronze images. So very, very strong local traditions may partly helped by the relatively uh, the isolated geographical condition, which I call qualified isolation. At the same time, the rivers enable Sichuan to be connected broad and far. That's why I say qualified, but it does have very strong geographical region as the one contributing uh, uh, factors. And also it connects with many different regions of China and even beyond what is a currently geographical China. So I think that is exciting. And so be able to uh, uh, construct the internal as well as external uh, connections that uh, the scientific culture had. And so I think it fundamentally changed the model of how we should understand ancient China, but of course, particularly for Sichuan. And of course, we humans always like writings, but we know that we all speak as humans, but we not necessarily write down things, every human race. And there are the advanced uh, civilizations such as ancient Peruvians, they're now using writing as well. Then the other ways to express. So I think this very complex iconography mm -hmm. largely expressed through bronze images, but also in other media such as stone and the jades are the keys for us to understand the character of the scientific day civilization. But our work is so early, I think it takes a um, long, long time. So I feel wonderful that I have the privilege of uh, studying the civilizations and I will never run out of things to do. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. I, yeah. I wanted, I, can, can we just, can you just talk quickly about, I know, I think we need to leave some time for questions and answers. Mm. Uh, but um, what were the, what were the hurdles we had to go through? Actually, uh, I like it. Actually, I I'd like to ask you exactly the same question. So let me start with a few. One is to, of course, to uh, the select the objects, and the objects are so extraordinary, and we are so ambitious that uh, the um, the objects uh, are way exceeding what normally permitted by Chinese government. Chinese government for exhibitions, they have a limitation on the number of the objects. 120 is usually their number. This exhibition, if you count every one object, I see that. But more importantly, they have a limit on the category or the uh, grades of the objects. They, they tend to classify the object into three grades, class one, class two, class three, class one being the top. Normally would only have a 20%. Our collection is more than half. I think about 65% class one. So the state administration of cultural heritage actually did not have the power to approve. It normally would have the power to approve international exhibition. It had to go all the way to the Chinese state council for Chinese top leaders to approve it. And, uh, uh, and uh, you probably remember you're sending the letters to many. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. government leaders as well as Chinese government leaders asking for their support. That's one. 
another, you know, to marshal the group of scholars to write a very uh, uh, in-depth catalog, which is a landmark publication and uh, was also extraordinary. And we, of course, had uh, earthquakes along the way. We have transportation issues and uh, some of which are the really most extraordinary. For example, just about, I think, uh, about less, about months, if my memory serves me, before we opened, Seattle had a major earthquake, the largest in recent history. So Chinese side immediately, of course, got concerned, asking, everything stops. You have to give us the uh, proposals how you mitigate the earthquake risks. So we have to marshal the resources, not only with the museum, but partner with UW, because they are known for their geological studies and others, and also demonstrate all our installation plan to demonstrate it will be safe. And then actually, to a little bit earlier, the objects were shipped, I think, in early February. After so they were, they, were, they were already in Seattle at the yeah, time. So of the earthquake. In early February 2001, after some, like two weeks after the arrival, the terrible incident of a mid-air collision between what? a US spy plane and a Chinese uh, fighter jet took place. And thus, US-China relations went below sub-zero. So are we going to have the show? But gladly, the objects were already in Seattle. If they had not been shipped, there would be no show. But it took a while to resolve that incident. But both sides feel culture exchange is important. So eventually, they uh, uh, allowed us to open the show on time. And there's others. So let me ask you, what are the most memorable moments or <laughs> incidents you remember? Well, certainly those some of those last moments were, but also in 1997, the first visit to Sanqing Dui. And I think just when we opened negotiations, yeah. uh, when we had the Chinese delegation from Sichuan came and we met with Gary Locke in the governor's office and the whole process of getting the, the gaining the trust of the Chinese officials. And we really worked for about three years. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, yeah, almost four years. Yeah, I think four years, yeah. So, so, I, so that was, but yeah. seeing the site was, yeah. I think was just, um, it, it completely, I, I, I was, I, I just didn't, it was awesome. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I think uh, Mimi, you missed one thing. You are being too modest because you raised the largest mm -hmm. amount of money from a corporation for any exhibitions. You 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 convinced a Boeing company at that time was based in Seattle, and uh, give uh, I think one point five million, and and from particularly from two thousand and eight financial crisis onward, it was. It is never going to be in no corporation give that kind of money for a single exhibition anymore. I was really in awe. I did not realize that some years later I would be in the same job raising money. <laughs> this was yeah. my primary focus <laughs> of my day life. <laughs> but the, it it did take a lot. But I don't somehow um, I that was the, we were undaunted by that, and I think Boeing very early on committed one and a half million, roughly half the budget. But those are expensive, but we got foundations, individuals, we, it, it really worked out well. Yeah, so maybe I if I, I see, phone has turned on camera, but if I can sneak in one last uh, uh, question to you is, why the art museum meaningful in a larger sense, more than this exhibition, of course, being an example. And can you talk about impact of special exhibition, especially international exhibitions? Like okay. the, the someone we did enhance the museum reputation. I, I, I want to be I want to be brief because um, I know people have a lot of a lot of questions. I see museums as a history from things, libraries are a history from books from words. But uh, to me, an art museum it's much more than a place for beautiful objects. It's a place to explore ideas and history. I always think of the, the head of the National Endowment for the Humanities who said, if you don't understand the past, how can you understand the present or predict the future? And uh, 
at Yale, the idea of his, as museums, it's a history from things. Uh, that was really what drew me into museums as a career. And this Chinese exhibition you know, brought to light a lost civilization and the entire way it, that um, Chinese civilization involved. And I think international exhibitions are an important way of, of, a, of scholarship, of exploring ideas, but also in terms of cultural diplomacy. I think they're, they're, are, are critical in terms of, I, I think for US-China relations, this exhibition really contributed to that. It's hard to measure, but it certainly increased people's understanding of China and how the richness and depth of Chinese civilization and it enhanced the museum's reputation. It traveled to Fort Worth, to the Kimball, to the Met, to Toronto. So now I think we should probably turn it over to Ping uh, to moderate the Q&A. Good morning to you both. And I hate to break into this wonderful conversation. I, I, I wish we had another hour to discuss with the both of you. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank the, the both of you for um, both your earlier vision and incredibly ambitious um, project to bring the spectacular finds of 1928 to Seattle. Um, I mean, I just did want to point out that you know, archaeology is something like a national pastime in China. It is so fascinating, even to the popular imagination. They even have a reality show, archaeology reality show. Um, so I, you know, I did, I want to thank you for this incredibly exciting, uh, to bring some of this excitement to um, our audiences here in Seattle and beyond on Zoom. So uh, some of this excitement is reflected in the long list of questions of which uh, we only have a few minutes for. So perhaps uh, you can uh, speak a little bit. I of course get to, to pick and choose which, I, um, which resonate with me. Uh, I did want to highlight one question who is from an archeologist <laughs> in amongst here, uh, uh, Professor Wang Hai Chung. Uh, this is a question for Jay which is, have the archaeologists done extensive coring, that is the, the scientific work around the eight pits to make sure there are no more pits to be discovered uh, in the area? Uh, thank you, Hai Sen, for the question. And before I answer that, I say, uh, Feng Ping, you're right. Uh, the uh, archaeology has become national pastime and there were fantastic, huge crowd getting uh, a national variety show. Actually, Mimi and I were on one of them for the 2001 exhibition. So we get our stage limelight <laughs> a little bit as well. Yes, the answer is yes. The archaeologists have been coring around those uh, six newly found pits. They found some other features, but um, not uh, the more pits at this point. But the, the next stage actually I learned is after the excavation of those six pits, they're really doing to ex extensive coring throughout the, uh, the, the, the scientific settlements. Because you know, so far we don't know how the elites dealt with the deceased, you know, whether they bury them or whether they, the other forms of uh, disposal of uh, the deceased, there's no uh, uh, burial ground. The burial ground uh, that indicated on the map in the, in the talk will belong to actually a Neolithic phase of the settlement and very small in scale. So there are so many things are uh, missing. This finding of this, six pits really rekindled the tremendous interest and the need for further exploration. Sandu actually sort of become a little bit of the victim of its own success because 1986 was so amazing that it turned out to be an archeological park that uh, with thousands of thousands of visitors. So archeology span has not been um, sort of always vibrant on the site. And, uh, but now I think a tremendous new impetus. Uh, yeah, it's, it seems that it, um, there are so many similarities with the first finds 
Um, but yet there's so also all these continuities. And one of the continuity occurs to me is that we still know so little about the true meaning. I mean, for, for the way that you observed just um, by careful looking, which is right side up, even something as simple as that <laughs> is not so easy to, to discover. And I guess partly that is that there is no written language still found in San Jin Dui. And you, you make this incredibly interesting point that written language is optional for an advanced civilization. Um, so I wonder if you might, you know, just um, talk a little bit more because of course the Shang had, uh, we do have this fully developed language uh, evidence of that at Shang. I mean, is there, uh, so what's, Sort of what evidence do we have now in the bigger, in the biggest picture of language use in the different regions? Yeah, I think uh, one thing is probably sh pretty sure is uh, the local population of San Hindi did not speak the same language as the uh, people mm -hmm. in the Song civilization. Mm -hmm. And it also happened that the uh, Song chose to uh, uh, express their writing, at least a part of their writing, on materials that are not perishable or less likely to perish, such as oracle bones, such as on bronzes. And of course, you know, there are the, maybe other civilizations, uh, including possibly San had uh, 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 writing on silk, on perishable materials that no longer survive. But I mm -hmm. think the importance is that while, of course, writing is extremely important, but that should not be considered the sort of the standard for civilization. And uh, people had multiple ways to express their thoughts. Oral tradition has always been extremely important in human, uh, 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 human life, even today, right? You know, there are many uh, ethnic groups rely on oral traditions to carry on their history and their customs. So I think uh, uh, we keep our mind open, but so far there's no trace of writing has been found. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there. Um, and even if we find something, it's a no telling. We can decipher it because so I don't think. Uh, 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 I mean, the uh, the possibility they appear similar as the or oracle bone inscription in sound and in science. I think uh, possibly always would be there, but would be kind of remote. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I uh, in graduate school I took. A, a class or two with your teacher <laughs> um, and we did this discuss Shan Xin Dui quite extensively um, so talked about sort of these items that were inside the tombs so you you mentioned something which I didn't hear about in our classwork uh, which is uh, this uh, the ivory and shells in connection to India um, so the sort of the the as you mentioned, Mimi uh, Casey John's very early idea of these interactive spheres. Uh, so, are you saying then that uh, this is a proof of these broader interactions and connections between civilizations and areas of the world, which we never knew about before? Yeah, and I think clearly, I think the, what I referred to was the quarry shells. So uh -huh. shells, and that particular type actually did not was not native to the Chinese coast, and uh, which is the east coast or, or East Sea or Yellow Sea, mm -hmm. and uh, there's clearly strong connections between Sanxin Dui, which is the upper region of the Yangtze River, to the lower region of Yangtze River, which empties into the sea in Shanghai, my hometown. For example, Neolithic civilization called the Liangzhu, clearly you know Sanxin Dui had a connection there, but the seashell most likely come from Indian Ocean. So long distance trade. But as I said, typically, you know, long distance trade is always through way stations, relays. For example, the most famous Silk Road, nobody traveled from Xi'an all the way to Rome. There are different trades along the way and trading certain section back and forth. And then this is a, the, the, would be the normal way. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, there's certainly long distance connections and uh, we know that the national boundaries are modern phenomena, right? And uh, the cultures are uh, connected and interconnected far and near. 
as you know, I would agree with you deeply <laughs> on that uh, comment. Uh, so I just received permission to go on for a few extra minutes, if that is all right with the both of you. Um, so that maybe we can take a couple of more questions. Um, so somebody had um, uh, was hoping that you would elaborate a little bit more about this idea of intentional breakage on, and destruction as part of these rituals, because of course, later civilization, both in China and in other areas like Japan, Jomon period, um, all had something similar. Uh, so Mingqi, of course, the idea of brilliant objects, the thing, tomb burial objects uh, that are made so that they do not work or are broken before they serve their purpose in tombs. So I wonder if you might um, say a little bit more about what we can speculate on the ritual function of such pits. I mean, you even call it a pit rather than a burial. So a kung as opposed to a mu. So Thank could you, you say it, maybe ex uh, explicate a little bit more? Yeah, I would typically call a burial if a, sort of like a burial of a human uh, body, right? And uh, so the pits uh, is a more generic term in this regard. And I think uh, if we all agree that in the most broadly defined uh, sense of a sacrifice, we're looking at deposits of uh, two sacrifices of same kind, because it involves burning and breaking and the barrier of the objects consumed in the spiritual activities. In this sense, I think we may actually find a stark contrast between San Hindu and in Zhongyuan. In Zhongyuan, you would, uh, in, in central China, in the Yellow River region, you would sacrifice the real humans. And the Song peoples were famous or notorious for the large consumption of actual humans and sacrifices. And another analogy calling to mind would be Mayans. And for that subject, Haitian would be much, much better prepared to talk about, you know, cross culture, a contrast. And um, so, but in San you don't see humans, skeletons, or traces, even the most easily survivable part of a human body, the teeth and the big toe, they don't find it. So which means they sacrifice images of humans. Imagine the life-size figure clearly is a person of a high status, maybe one of the highest status person. And in a gesture of offering, yet this figure itself ended up in the sacrifice. So I think, uh, you know, sacrificing images and the elite self-sacrifice that involving the breaks and the burning, I think is a phenomenon we need to take into consideration as a possibility. I think so this is a part of my interpretation, but breaking mm -hmm. things to make it sacred from mundane to sacred is very common in human life. I mean, even, you know, all different, some are more religious long traditions, some a, a more recent phenomenon. We are in right now, I think in the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and in Jewish, wedding, you have to break something, <laughs> to break something. And, and this phenomenon exists in many cultures, in cultures, the regional culture in China today as well. So breaking is not necessarily a narrowly defined destructive action. Actually, maybe a very important action to make some tangible things to possess intangible features to be communicated in a supernatural way or make them mundane to sacred. Mm -hmm. That's a, thank you for that excellent answer. It's so very interesting. Um, but we are almost uh, uh, at the end of our time. Uh, I just wanna end with one question that has just come in, which exactly dovetails with my, my own question, which is about perhaps, are we thinking about another Sanchin Dui show? I mean, is there uh, enough to, uh, to do something like that? Uh, and the, the question is, um, for the both of you, uh, Jay and Mimi, what do you think? Will it be easier or harder to organize another show of this scale of magnitude and interest after all 20 years of great changes in both US and Chinese history and um, relationships? all the dramatic changes that have happened since the Seattle show. What do you think? 
I, I would just say, I uh, certainly our timing was impeccable. I think uh, we, our, our timing, we were in a moment that was uh, very propitious in terms of US-China relations. And this was a brand new excavation and there was uh, an openness on the officials who are in place. Um, today, uh, I'll let Jay elaborate, but I, I think the tensions between the two countries, I like to think, I would hope that it would still be possible. I think it would take considerable work and considerable uh, you know, expense fundraising. But to me, there's no shortage of topics to explore and new objects that have come to light. And I think, I mean, I think it would be a fantastic show. Jay actually is doing a show with Wuhan, right, Jay? Yes. So um, these international exhibitions are certainly possible, and I think it's important to continue them. But Jay, why, why don't you uh, give your thoughts? Uh, the, uh, the miles is a yes and no. Let me first talk about no part. Quite a number of objects, including 2001 show, are now blacklisted. China has in, become you know, rightfully very, very concerned about uh, the, uh, uh, the fragility of many national treasures. So they, uh, after our show, actually just about that time, they established a national list of objects that can never travel out of China. Of course, the number one object would be the Zhenghou Yi bells, the 64 bells, right, and from Hubei. But many Sanyin Dui objects are included there as well. So for example, the life-size figure can no longer travel. You could travel a replica of it, but the original can never leave China anymore. So in this regard, it would be difficult. And of course, there was no uh, uh, museum director like Mimi. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm a museum no. director, but you know, I don't know how we can have the money and uh, among other things. But it is also, yes, because um, one, another extraordinary thing is on February the 8th, when the shipment for the Seattle show uh, uh, was made, you know, shipped to the airport to be shipped to here. I was in Chengdu, obviously, for that shipment. That's the day the Qingsa site, which I alluded to, you know, the wooden figure was discovered. So I was among the first one on site to, to look at the Qingsa discovery. And because of course, Qingsa was, had just been discovered, it cannot be included in the show, right? So the Qingsa material had never really have an extensive exposure in North America. Of course, that body of material is smaller and fewer, but still many significant. And the given the pace of the excavation going on now, among six pits, I think they have found more than 10 sound objects. Of course, conservation will take up some time, but clearly doable. As Mimi said, you know, in the scale of archaeological time, 30 years is a less than a second. Right? It, does, that's a, it still takes generations to study them. So we're in the beginning of the journey of to understand that civilization. So there's so many things we can do about it. And back in, um, nine, uh, in early 2000, we actually offered the show to Asia Museum in San Francisco. Maybe because of the close distance, about 800 miles, you know, as I said, you know, not that far early on. So uh, 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 at that time, Asian Art Museum was not able to host the show. So it went to, you know, three other museums. So in other words, as a holistic treatment of the civilization, San Francisco did not have the opportunity. So I really having my appetite whetted. And I don't know, it's hard to find time as a museum director to do scholarly work, but uh, if, or if I'm lucky enough that I will actually want to personally curate a show, a Sanxin Dui, and for San Francisco, and if Seattle wants it, <laughs> so, yeah, that would be up to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Amanda Cruz, of course. Uh, so wonderful. And speaking of wedding appetites, that certainly has wet mine and has really fired my imagination. What a fantastic uh, conversation. I wish 
we had another hour. In fact, I could easily go on another hour chatting with you both. This is, this is such a rich topic and we've only just, obviously, just scratched the surface. So thank you, Jay. Thank you, Mimi, for this conversation. Um, so, and thank you to the audience who have stayed with us uh, over the time. And um, I um, just wanted to also announce uh, the thank you for the uh, kickoff to this season's Gardner Center uh, Saturday University Lecture Series. Um, we have the next one next month, same time, same place, uh, which is a lecture by award-winning author Colin uh, Thubron on his recent book titled The Amur River Between Russia and China. So I hope to see everyone back uh, on Zoom at this time. Uh, so thank you for coming and um, I uh, do hope you have a wonderful Saturday uh, and uh, back to school, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>